Welcome to our eighth in a series of video time capsules commemorating the 75th anniversary of the University of Wisconsin Eau Claire. I'm Eric Wheeler, moderator for today's panel discussion. It's Friday, May 22nd, 1992, and we're going to talk about the past, present, and future of this university in addressing the theme of the 75th observance yesterday, today, and tomorrow. First of all, I'd like to introduce our panelists for this morning. Um, starting off with Dr. Dale Johnson. Dr. Johnson is an assistant professor in management Inter information systems department here in the School of Business at UW-Eau Claire. Uh, Dr. Johnson formerly was the assistant dean and assistant dean at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee and he came to Eau Claire in 1987. He has uh, uh, served on a uh, committee called the World Future Society for the last 15 years. Ms. Penelope Cicchini is a professor of piano in the music department and coordinator of the keyboard division. Uh, and she started at UWEC in 1966. Uh, she studied in southern Tuscany, uh, Italy, focusing on Chopin's etudes. I, I know from my own experience, I have heard uh, Ms. Cicchini perform on the Live from the Elvium series broadcast on Wisconsin Public Radio. Dr. Paul Thomas is an assistant professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy here at the University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire. Uh, he was an organizer of the International Symposium on Comets at UWEC last fall. Paul is from Australia. He has a PhD from Monash University there. And his research interests include uh, using computers to analyze data returned from planetary spacecraft. And Angela Ferkus has joined us also this morning. Angela is a graduate student pursuing an MA in history here at UW-Eau Claire. Uh, she has worked as a graduate assistant in the graduate school office. Angela is studying Indian women and the early history of the Eastern Sioux. Angela received her BA in history from UW-Eau Claire in 1970. Welcome to our discussion this morning. The video time capsule looking back analyzing where we are currently and looking ahead um, at the University of Wisconsin Eau Claire. I'd like to start off our discussion with uh, an opportunity for you to address the question of what, how does the University of Wisconsin Eau Claire, what, what is the campus culture here? How would you define the atmosphere on campus? Not only in terms of the academic atmosphere, but perhaps also the cultural atmosphere, the interpersonal relationships here on campus. What does UW-Eau Claire mean to you? And I'd like to start off uh, with Dr. Dale Johnson. I think when you describe the uh, interpersonal relationships, you really are describing, for me, uh, UW-Eau Claire. I have taught at uh, two other universities that were strikingly different from Eau Claire. Both of them were uh, situations in which uh, there, were, there were doctoral programs, there were uh, using doctoral students to teach classes, to help with research, and the demands for, for, for building interpersonal relationships with students really weren't there. I could, uh, I could teach and then I could disappear and do research for a long time, and uh, the only time I actually saw students was when I was standing up in front of a class and there were students out in front of me. But I would, um, there wasn't an expectation that a student would knock on my door and sit down for half an hour and talk about something. Yeah. It's an entirely different situation here. The, the assumption here is that we are instructors, that we can teach, that, uh, that we're very approachable, that, uh, that we are in tune with, um, in my case, what's going on in the business community, and that uh, if students are talking about jobs, or talking about careers, or talking about uh, about the substance of a, of a particular course or research, the assumption is they can sit down and talk about it. It's entirely different from environments that I've been in before. And I, I like it. I think, it's, uh, I think it adds a community atmosphere. I think it adds much more of a family atmosphere than, a, than almost a, a corporate atmosphere that I've uh, experienced in some of the other areas. Not that one is any better than the other. I think they both have, have strong points. But this one is... Um, is uh, considerably different. I think it's positive. Good. Thank you. Ms. Cicchini. If I were to describe the student population of this university, I would say that our students represent a microcosm 
of this geographic area. And despite the honest uh, attempts at di diversity, I realize that this university will have a very difficult time trying to fulfill the very elevated goals that the university has as established. It's going, it's going to be difficult, I, I feel, when you look at the demographics of this area. There aren't many blacks living in this area. There aren't Japanese people living in this area. And were it not for the university trying to get a, broad, a more broad spe spectrum in uh, faculty, I, I think this alone does a great deal to encourage and show students that we're trying to think about the whole world, if, if you will. I think at this very time, we are probably very keenly aware of, of religious beliefs, sexual orientation, and race as well. And I hope that as time passes, we will become less an insular university and begin to think, indeed, on a more international level. I think that uh, what our foreign language department has done to encourage the study of foreign languages has gone far to help us bring people from other nations here. And that began long ago. That's not just something of today. But I feel like I must mention that from our very strong uh, foreign languages that we have gone far in our ability to attract people from outside the continental United States. Very good. Thank you. Dr. Thomas. Um, when Dale mentioned that UW Eau Claire was quite different from the research oriented universities he'd been to, that certainly struck a bell with me because I've spent most of my career so far in either research oriented universities or research institutions. Um, the wonderful thing about Eau Claire is that those doors aren't blocked here either. Research is expected uh, and produced by the faculty, expected of and produced by the faculty, uh, and student involvement is, is also encouraged. But there is, there is both time and expectation here that you will get to know your students, not just academically, but in terms of, uh, of their personal growth. And uh, given, their, given the ages of the students we have here, by and large, that, that's some of the more exciting years in which to know a person when they're stretching out their intellectual wings for the first time and they're really uh, starting to realize what they're interested in, what they'd like to do. Uh, another, um, to my mind, uh, rich uh, element in the campus culture is, is the uh, interpersonal relationships between faculty in different departments, something that's, of course, given lip service to in every university mm -hmm. in the world. Um, but in most cases that I'm aware of, it, it certainly is lip service and nothing more. Um, but this is a university where classicists and um, physicists talk uh, and share ideas. And if one of the things that we've learned from the explosion of our knowledge in the 20th century is that there really are very deep interrelationships between quite widely disparate fields of knowledge. Uh, you ignore those, and you ignore the things that you can learn from applying them. Uh, to my mind, Eau Claire is, is a very fertile place for encouraging those sorts of interests. And, uh, uh, and that's certainly been one of the appeals of the institution for me. Thank you. Ms. Fergus. I'm not sure if it's because of my transition from being an undergrad student to a graduate student, but I also have noticed that there's been a growth in faculty members being interested in what students are doing. I find that the faculty members that I have for my classes right now are very, very involved in my life, and they've become friends and mentors much more so than when I was an undergraduate. And I think that that's, that's a, a great um, growth if it is actually a growth in the membership of the faculty members or whether it's because of my transition to a graduate student. But talking about relationships between students, I think that my opinion right now is a little bit different than it might have been a few months ago because of the hate crimes that have been on campus against um, people who practice different lifestyles. And I think that it's, it's really, um, it's just not a good sign that people seem to be more and more reluctant to accept people with different types of lifestyles. Very good comments. And I think I'm going to take off on that because I've, I've heard from you 
this morning, and I've heard from some of the other panelists, that one of the real attractions about Eau Claire and this campus is that it is in many ways perhaps somewhat um, um, isolated or insulated from some of the greater problems of the world, the problems of the inner city in America, uh, the, the problems with, with uh, factionalism and, uh, and strife uh, throughout the world, that we here in Eau Claire are not only a homogeneous society ethnically, um, but, but we have this, this sort of feeling of security. And I think Angela has brought up the point that we aren't completely, totally isolated from the problems of the outside world. We have had the, these incidents this past year. And I'm wondering how you respond, how, you, uh, how the rest of you would respond to that, and how can UW Eau Claire perhaps, as you, as you answer the question, maybe reflect on the, the system-wide initiative for design for diversity, how can we here in Eau Claire um, become part of the solution and not so much continuing the problem? Go ahead. <laughs> I, would, I would like to uh, answer that in a circuitous fashion because I've thought a little bit about uh, the question that you had posed to us. How do you think education here might change mm -hmm. in the next 50 years? Okay. And it seems to me that we might go far to help the issue of dealing with that which we don't understand mm. very well by, um, I, this, is a, this is a far out idea, I don't know what we would subtract from the students' courses, required mm. courses, but it seems to me that if there were a semester that a student were required to be outside the United States, either as a student in a foreign country or as a worker in a foreign country. Perhaps both of those experiences, the one semester would be as a, a student and another as a worker, would go far to show people here that we are not the answer, mm -hmm. that we're not the only mm -hmm. answer. That the minute we remove ourselves and take ourselves to a place where we are much less secure, we begin to get an appreciation of those people who have been coming here as foreign students or with a lifestyle that is different that will allow us an appreciation far beyond the book learning that we might get by registering for Human Sexuality 101, if you will. I, when I am in a foreign country, it's hard for me to... to, to how, how do you try to let somebody know that you're smart if you cannot speak their language. You know, you, re you result to something which is, is trying and maybe cute, but that doesn't show them that you really can think. Okay. And so I believe the experiences of foreign study and foreign work are a valid consideration for the university to help answer this, this problem. It's an intriguing idea. Go ahead, Diane. <coughs> there's, uh, there's another point that goes along with that. I think that uh, that we're, uh, our procedures for enrolling students, for, for admitting students, end up, to be, end up to give us a very homogeneous type of a student body, which, uh, which to me is, uh, is a detriment right now. We, uh, we look at test scores very, very ex exclusively, and the student gets, somebody could walk in with a tremendous background in, in foreign studies and uh, or life experience on, on jobs or some kind of a situation and, uh, and if they didn't have the test scores they wouldn't get in. The, what they could offer to a classroom or to the university would be lost because they aren't competing with other students. And I hear that more from faculty members now than I did four or five years ago. That they feel that, uh, that we are taking students that have higher and higher test scores out of high school. But the students are starting to look an awful lot alike. Mm -hmm. And that we're losing, we're losing some of the differences here that um, that have really uh, been important. Uh, I think we should, uh, you know, the Board of Regents has just made a decision relative to senior citizens auditing classes, and and I think that's a um, I think that's a mistake. We've had I've had classes, for example, I had a class once where I had a 92 year old gentleman who owned his own business for 45 years, and and that that class came alive when he walked in the door. I mean, it was uh, it was very exciting. But we don't seem to have that now. I think we need, to, and I think part of the problem is that we really haven't developed ways of evaluating. We've relied on test scores really because maybe that's all we have. If we had some other ways of looking at students 
and deciding upon characteristics and uh, what they could add to the university and what they could get out of it, besides just looking at, um, at a test score, the quantitative test score, the test that they've taken, I think we would have a better chance at a, at a little bit more diverse population uh, besides the students that we have. That issue of the non-traditional student and the what may be an increasing role of the non-traditional student here at UW-Eau Claire is a really important one. I want to pursue that, but I'd like to hear Dr. Thomas, or I, if I can call you Paul. Sure. You're from Australia, and I'd like to hear your reflections on, on how you feel this university, uh, is it sensitive to the outside world? Um, what, uh, perhaps what could we do to increase an international awareness here on campus? As, as, as both Penny and Dale have said, this is obviously the direction which um, it's certainly important to go. Um, and it's not really an optional choice. Short of moving Eau Claire to the planet Mars, uh, we're going to become increasingly involved in issues that, that originate beyond Eau Claire. Um, not just, of course, societal issues, although they're, they're of crucial importance, but environmental issues, too. Okay. Um, uh, Australia is, is, in part, very much like Wisconsin. It's a mm -hmm. massive, rich country. And if you're in the middle of it, you can almost believe that there's no one else in the world. Um, in fact, I was born in England, and when I arrived in Australia, I was astonished at the, the, the intellectual insularity mm. uh, of that country, which has now changed due to immigration. Um, I think there always has to, there always, in, in a setting like this, has to exist tensions. Um, as Dale said, we need to enrich our student body uh, with a wide range of people from various ages. But of course, since we're an educational institution, a very important role that we have to play here is to stretch our existing students who come from uh, middle-class homes in northwestern Wisconsin, largely, um, to realize that they're citizens of the world, to realize that if you don't know one foreign language, you don't know a great deal about the world, to realize that the way the United States and the United States government presents the world affairs isn't always the only way that one should look at these. And I think that, um, um, that there are many things that can be done here. Obviously, the, the, the basket you end up with is something that results from, from um, from debate and consensus, but they include, for example, some sort of requirement for, for increased foreign, uh, foreign uh, language and uh, culture studies. Um, they they, they uh, include increased availability and perhaps even expectations that students will not just travel overseas, but, for example, have educational experience associated with people in different cultures in the United States, like Native Americans. Um, Sue McIntyre right now is working on a distance learning um, project associated with students in high schools in the inner city of Milwaukee. Uh, and many of the students that I encounter seem to find the inner cities of this nation as alien as they would find Tibet, for example. That's mm. vitally important, um, uh, you know, particularly in light of the events of 1992 to realize that this country is going to centrifugally split apart unless we realize we're all part of the same culture. Um, um, you know, small projects here that have involved interviewing uh, and doing societal projects on uh, uh, Hispanic um, uh, rural workers in Wisconsin you know, can be continued and encouraged. Students in the sciences and the professional schools um, should be encouraged to take them. So I, I, I see a whole, a whole basket of things like that uh, where, where the issues are ultimately that you end up with some weighting um, that essentially results in no student being unchallenged. Uh, uh, all students are forced to to, to look at, at themselves and their society uh, in a different light. Um, if, if, we, uh, if we aren't stretching them in this way, then there's an important part of our task here that, um, that, that is undone, even if they graduate being excellent business majors or, or excellent um, um, musical instrumentalists or excellent physicists. Um, I think a liberal arts college has goals that stretch beyond that. I'm going to spin off on that idea. Uh, Dr. Ernest Boyer of the Carnegie Foundation was here a, a number of weeks ago as part of a forum on the future of higher education. One of the suggestions he made was for what he called a 414 curriculum, that you would have your, your typical semester, the fall semester with the, the uh, four, um, the weighted, weighted to four in terms of the number of credits the, that you would have for the year, and then the spring semester with an equal number of credits, and then sort of sandwiched in between would be this one semester of, of independent study, sort of spinning off on Penelope's idea of that, of that required international experience. How do you think an institution of this size, with this much um, academic diversity, from the School of Business to the School of Education to the School of Nursing to the Fine Arts Center to the um, Athletic Department, 
could there be, do you think, it, A, it would be practical or desirable to have a modified 414 where that one would be perhaps a month, perhaps two weeks, perhaps three weeks of mandatory variation from the pattern, whether it's international or multicultural, or perhaps for someone who's been a couch potato, they have to, have to get involved in some sort of athletic regimen for a month something that would tie in with the design for diversity in terms of requiring a different experience, whether it's intellectual, interpersonal, multicultural. Um, this idea of 414 I know has been implemented in smaller liberal arts colleges where there's perhaps an enrollment of 2,000 or less. Could something like this be instituted at an institution of this size? Would it be desirable? Maybe I should address that to a student <laughs> who's currently studying. How do you re react to that, um. Angela? Well, I would be all for it because the way that I approached my undergraduate career was I wanted to get as much out of it as possible. Okay. I took the most diverse classes that I could. I studied abroad twice, mm -hmm. and I really tried to um, develop my own plan for design for diversity. Mm -hmm. But I'm not really sure how other students would react to that, somebody who wants to get in and get out in four years and with some of the requirements for some of the degrees it's really hard to do that unless if you become a major in that department as a freshman and stick to it all four years so in that way it would have to be you'd have to work with the departments so that they would make it available that the student could be gone for a certain period of time and still finish in the four years like they want to. Dr. Johnson, you, you work with many students who are very vocationally oriented, they're very job oriented. How do you think students in the business school would respond to what in effect would be sort of a mandatory uh, academic regimen or, or experience that would be not really with on their career track as it were? I, I've been involved in some programs that have tried to do that, yeah. and anytime you, anytime you move in one direction, you avoid some other directions. Mm -hmm. If we look at our field right now, which is information systems, we have an overriding demand that really pushes our curriculum, pushes any kind of extra activities that we have, and that is to try to keep people as close as we can to a field that's changing daily. We can't, any, everything we do, in other words, if we design a new class, the object is to figure out how to get that class absolutely in tune with industry. In information systems, we feel we're training managers. It's a management degree. We feel that we're training people who can manage technical people, but it's really a management degree. Mm -hmm. Or what that means is that, if, that uh, if we decide on an, on an extra activity, that activity should probably be how do, we, how do we immediately put students in touch with people in the industry. Okay. We, right now we have an eight-month internship where they spend eight months on a job in Milwaukee or in the Twin Cities uh, for a very good salary, uh, but, it's a, but it's a tremendous learning experience. Mm -hmm. And that was an effort to say, if we want to add something right now to the student curriculum, what do we do? We put them in touch with, with the changing field. We have trouble on campus doing that kind of activity. We can't, uh, digital equipment in the cities turns out a new machine every four weeks. Uh, we're dealing with a textbook, and, and that's uh, that's at most at, at at the least two years old, and uh, journals that are six months old, and so it's almost impossible for us to keep up with the industry. And so, anytime we talk about adding something to the student curriculum, the overriding concern is how do we put them in touch with the industry, technology, uh, some of the microwave things that we're instituting probably is some long distance uh, video hookups, video conferencing between companies. We have a number of companies interested in doing that. We think we can bring the industry right into the classroom. So if you were to ask me what, what we really need for the future, I would immediately go in that direction. Okay. Good. But I'm really talking about our field now, not the total university experience. Sure. Good, good comment. <laughs> go and ahead. then this brings up the <coughs> disparity between the yearnings on, on the one hand to broaden each student's outlook mm -hmm. and the, 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 the needs really for a program that is as specific as this one that we've just been talking about. 
perhaps, uh, perhaps the university needs to rethink what its main mission is. It, does this university want to be a liberal arts school? Or does this university want to try to serve as many needs as we presently have? Maybe, maybe the university is going to have to change in some regard. We have very many professional schools in this university. Maybe it's not possible to do all of the things that we think we need to do with all of these degrees. If we were to come back to being a liberal arts, just a liberal arts school, it would be more easy to accommodate the 414. I have every respect for the needs of the professional schools. I understand it completely. There are certain things that simply must be done. But in a liberal arts situation, maybe those things could be done. The program could be more free to allow those things to be inserted into the program. Okay. Eric, as, as you're probably aware, and I think everyone here is aware, one response to this, and may we will see the ultimately the success of this, of course, is the Vice Chancellor's redefinition of the Baccalaureate Degree Commission, mm -hmm. uh, which is ultimately a response to the Chancellor's uh, mandate to see if there is a, a whole way of looking at all degrees here um, to design ways in which they can become more interdependent, to design, for example, a capstone course, a freshman experience that everyone shares. Mm -hmm. These are all ideas we've been talking around with, um, techniques like electronic mail bulletin boards to share various ideas um, with very little investment of time for each individual. But, um, and of course, it's very difficult. As you say, you run into these problems all the time. You know, even though physics is not, of course, a professional school, it's a liberal arts department like anywhere else, um, uh, you know, we, we face exactly the same problems that Dale talks about, of course. Our students that go out to grad school, even if they took all our physics courses, would not have as many mm -hmm. physics courses as if they went to Cornell or a mm -hmm. research school. Um, uh, some of our most outstanding students, and I guess I can say this because I didn't advise any of them, I'm amazed they got away with this, flashed through all their physics and math courses in first and second years, uh, and then the liberal arts college, a uh, liberal arts course has got sandwiched in at the end, mm. and, and I've talked to someone just graduating. Yeah, exactly, and, mm. and they, uh, you know, some of our bright students just graduating, and some of them came here early, of course, because they were academically outstanding. And so at the age of 21, having, you know, having fulfilled a super degree containing all the science courses, they suddenly say, wow, you know, I did uh, um, uh, uh, early medieval European history this time for the first time, and gee, it was interesting, but I'm going to graduate school next year. <laughs> That's it. That, the window to the world opens briefly. Um, so, so there is, is a real problem reconciling us, but, but, but at least this t represents one attempt to try. Yeah. Yeah. We have a problem that I, think, that I think we have to overcome, just as every other institution I've been involved in. And that is assuming that there's a huge difference between professional schools and, and arts and science. If you look at arts and science, you will have, you will have a lot of skill courses. Mm -hmm. and, and we have an awful lot of courses that, that involve creativity. If you, started to look at, if you started to look at competencies on one end and started to describe these competencies as straight skill level and these straight creativity of these, whatever, in each discipline, you would find a tremendous amount of overlap. We teach as much creativity as we can. We teach an awful lot of writing. We teach a lot of speaking in our classes. And I know that you can go to many other classes, including mathematics and foreign language and probably and undoubtedly physics, oh, and look at some straight skill development. And, and if, we just, if, we, if we get in the habit of saying that this is professional level and it's, and it's straight skill level, or this, and this is, I think we're creativity on one hand, I think we're making a mistake because there are an awful lot of similarities. Actually, one of the things that, that heartened me coming here, having not experienced undergraduate education in any great degree before, was that, that the problem seems to me not the professional schools on one hand and, and the, the, the liberal arts schools on the other. But there is nonetheless a problem. All, all, all the departments are getting centrifugally stretched because the demands are, are so high. Yeah. Um, right. but, but certainly the professional schools aren't the problem here. I mean, we, we, all, we all share our mm -hmm. ass. And I, I think that's a, strong, that's a very strong case to be made about, about UW Eau Claire. I think we spend an awful lot of time with, with people in other disciplines. Yes. And I think that's valuable. I think, what, I think the end result is a, is a much more cohesive program. And I teach, you know, we have a lot of, we have a lot of speaking. You know, the students spend a lot of time preparing, preparing speeches in front of classrooms. And I know what they teach in the 202 class in, in speech. And, and that's valuable. I think it, I think it does, uh, I think it adds, it enables us to blend together 
in a way that I haven't seen before. And I think that's important. The redefinition of the baccalaureate degree would then just enhance or provide more institutional support for the kind of, of integrative preparation that you're referring to. Sure. Sure. In fact, uh, Eric, one, one small part of that this year was um, uh, a grants program that was associated with uh, um, teaching experiments and interdisciplinary courses. Um, uh, the grants were small, but it was at least a sign of institutional support that um, uh, anyone, even, even in a school like this, of course, interdisciplinary courses uh, and the like have serious problems because of the nature of, um, uh, of curriculum uh, committees and the nature of who gets credit for what hours of the professor's time. Um, you know, th this, is, this is, of course, a problem that, if anything, is easier at Eau Claire than many other places, but it's still a problem. Um, this was an experiment um, to attempt, at least, um, to, to create some courses that, that, that would demonstrate our ability to, to, to tie together disciplines. We'll see what happens next. Good comment. I'm going to change the direction just slightly for a few minutes here. Angela, you, you're studying Native American traditions mm -hmm. and culture. It has been said that for, for generations, the American Indians were the invisible people in our society. In Eau Claire, in the greater community, and here on campus, are Native Americans invisible? Um, that's, really, that's really interesting because I went to a powwow just a few weeks ago, and I wanted to get to know some of the Native American students on campus. And I noticed that they were all sitting together and, like any group does, being very, um, because they were all friends and, and kind of insulating themselves from the rest of the people there. And I thought about that and I wanted to go up and to talk to somebody because I did know a few of the people, but yet I wasn't sure how they would receive me walking into, so I felt the minority walking into their majority. And so I hesitated and I didn't. And I thought, well, maybe I'll see her later and I'll talk to her if she's by herself. So in a way, it's almost like they're invisible if you don't seek them out because they wish it to be that way, or at least it appears that they wish it to be that way. So it's, it's a difficult question to answer because it depends on your perspective. Maybe they also see themselves as invisible because people don't go up and talk to them but yet they don't see my perspective of how hard it is. And then they should understand what it is to be a minority. So if I would say that, I'm sure they would understand. But yet it would probably be something that wouldn't even occur to them. What can we do as an institution to, to increase the frequency and the intensity of multicultural contacts, uh, whether they're with inner city blacks from Milwaukee or tribesmen from, from uh, South Africa? It, do you see any institutional um, steps that we could take here to broaden our cultural, intercultural contacts? Perhaps within the context of the design for diversity, uh, uh, faculty recruitment, um, student recruitment, um, there is now a, a human relations requirement, if I'm not mistaken, that you are, that all, all graduates are required to take. I think that can be somewhat, shall we say, pro forma. Uh, I mean, it can be something that, as you say, I mean, you can sort of just get through it to get through it. Um, that's, that's a hazard of any institutional directive. But uh, maybe here in Eau Claire, we a, have a unique opportunity to, uh, to reach out and try some initiatives uh, based on our tradition as a school of education, as, as being, a, being a teaching institution, having that as the core of our focus. What can we do here? to broaden multicultural understanding and context. I think one of the things we, one of the things we should think about is, is using the technology. Okay. If we look at many other, many other components of society, they have, dis, they have chosen to use telecommunication methodologies and to make them invisible, what we call invisible. Okay. In other words, if we look at in microcosm, if we see somebody in a company, for example, that gets on the phone and, and dials a number or pulls up a, a data source on a computer, they go through a menu on the screen, they, they, punch up, they punch up a number, and on comes the data. Now, they don't know whether that data is coming from their own disk, whether it's coming from a mainframe down the block, or whether it's coming from another computer across country. The object is to make it invisible. So we've, made local, so we've, we've literally have shortened the size of the nation yeah. by using telecommunications. 
what we have, the situation we have here now is that those differences are visible, very mm -hmm. visible. And we haven't figured out a way, way to make them invisible. And one of the things that technology can do is to put us right across the room from an awful lot of people. Yeah. Uh, telephone lines, for example, um, we currently use uh, regular twisted pair phone lines, twisted pair of copper wires for phone lines. And what that gives us is what we call partial motion video. But, huh. that's, but you can see somebody sitting there, and, they, and you have facial expressions as though you're sitting right across the room from somebody. And uh, when you get done talking to people who have been in on a video conferencing session, they, they assume that they were sitting there talking to somebody. You know, we haven't figured out in higher education very well, you know, in, in any measure of how, to, of how to shorten the size of things, how to make things smaller. An awful lot of other organizations have. Hospitals have. Um, some school systems have. Certainly the military has. And, and businesses have where they would, they would just as soon have somebody across country than in the same room because they bring them right in front of them, full screen size, and they talk to them, they show them things. They can, they can sit there and eat their lunch if they want to, and, they, and they've shortened the size. But we've, uh, we've put up some barriers, I think, that have, that have made the job difficult for us. And so when you ask the question about how do we get closer <coughs> to an organization, that's difficult now because it's a very large gulf. We haven't really used technology to do that. Now, unfortunately, we are, in universities, we are, we are uh, reactive rather than proactive in our use of technology. Uh, it's not going to be long before we're going to have university professors brought right into their school because the technology is available, maybe from Madison and Milwaukee, uh, because we haven't been able to hire somebody or we can't find somebody, and pretty soon there somebody is long distance by television, and we will react to that. And I would rather have have uh, the things that we're doing now put us in a proactive mode of saying exactly what telecommunication, what can telecommunications do for us to answer the question that you have and put us in, in a proactive mode rather than to just react to what's coming toward us. And I think uh, it can do an awful lot for us. Other organizations in, this, in the nation have done that, but I think that's an, it's an important step for us in the future. Good comments. Uh, Eric, mm -hmm. I guess I'd like to pick up on one uh, or several points of Dale. Um, but before, uh, before I talk about, I, I absolutely agree with him that, that technology is an important key here. But since I spent a significant amount of my research world uh, and life in front of a computer, uh, <laughs> and, and I, I, I really don't want to offend Penny in the middle of this discussion, I, I, I want to preface this by saying that I don't believe that anything can, um, uh, can substitute in a student or a faculty person's experience for traveling to a country, for being thrown in, for having to deal with real people uh, face to face. Um, my research experience is, is in numerical simulation, but even I don't believe that you can simulate the world. However, however, uh, one of the more significant um, advances in this university, and it's not even campus-wide yet, in the last year was the attachment of, of the university computers to the internet, the network of networks that now spans the world, maybe uh, one and a half million computers. Um, and one of the many things that it allows for those computers, limited computers on campus that are currently linked, is access to massive databases at very high speed. Um, for example, my ability to use a Cray supercomputer at Lawrence Livermore Labs and to have graphics from simulations appear in real time on my screen. But even aside from the professional research aspects, the ability of students to communicate with each other over long distances or to subscribe to bulletin boards. Uh, we now subscribe to hundreds of national level bulletin boards on such disparate fields as uh, Greek culture and uh, sexuality. Um, some of them are excellent illustrations of the, uh, of the flawed idea that all you need to start um, to get world peace is to have people talk to each other. Once you see a few of these discussions, you realize that, that things are quite insoluble. But, but that's a lesson, too, in fact. Um, certainly when I grew up in Australia, and, and from that I extrapolate to the experience of young people here, if you're not involved in quite intractable cultural problems that spring from your own upbringing, you have a very simplified view of, 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 of the world. Mm -hmm. and all it takes is for the Arabs and Israelis to talk to each other, right? All it takes is for the various Yugoslav uh, cultural and ethnic groups to start talking to each other. You have to realize that the world is, is far tougher to, to deal with than that. Um, there have been experiments here in extending email networks to the schools, uh, in part to allow better access uh, of faculty to school teachers and school children for discussions. And this is, again, this is by no means a substitute for real life, but it's a tool. It's an important tool. And, uh, and this is, I think, an important step that's occurred in the last few years. As Dale said, we have a very long way to go. Uh, 
One of the reasons we can do this and not full motion video, of course, is that the bandwidth is so much narrower. But we need both. We need all of this. Uh, we need students to, uh, to become proficient in looking up databases all around the world to find the information they want. Um, the, uh, um, the, 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 the kind of amusing games of Carmen Sandiego uh, that many students play on their PCs is a wonderful illustration of that. Because all of a sudden, students realize that the world of information, not just the limited world of the library at Eau Claire, is a world that they too can access. And this is certainly a direction I think is vital to, um, to move into. Excellent comments. And I know this is a subject that is near and dear to the heart of my co-moderator, Larry Lynch. And he should perhaps be sitting here at this point. But I'm wondering, it, it just any, any final comments on, on technology, the role of technology in the future here? Or perhaps maybe some comments from, from those of you that maybe aren't quite as involved with, with technology as, as Paul and Dale are. Uh, an opportunity for, for open comments, or we can, we can uh, go a different direction? So I thought when go ahead. The, when the question came up about te technology, obviously I'm not, uh, uh, I, I know very little about it, which is not to say I don't want to realize how it can, how it can help me. But when uh, I had heard that we might be asked to predict what is going to happen by the year 2050, I immediately thought to myself, is it possible that now that we uh, are learning how to do things through the use of buttons and taking a look at screens, will the human race, because it has gotten away from handwriting at a much earlier age and onto a computer with buttons, will we no longer know other people's handwriting without their signature. As you know right now, the people who work in your immediate area and your family don't even have to sign their names to handwritten messages because you know whose it is. Once you see it, it's theirs. It's indelible just as the personality is. That, that might be one thing that I would say we will lose as we become more uh, wedded to these machines. It's uh, perhaps not a thing that uh, we need to shed tears over, but I'm just wondering if handwriting then will be something less mine than it is right now in 50 to 75 years. A wider sense of that would be, of course, the concern that handwriting is as a symptom of, of just interpersonal contact. I mean, how much oh, of this yes. gets lost? Uh, that's not a world I think any of us would care to live in. Mm -hmm. um, I, I believe that computers can, although of course not necessarily will, um, serve as ways to become transparent. I'm only interested mm -hmm. in computers when I can see mm -hmm. through them to the world mm -hmm. beyond. Mm -hmm. um, in the 1960s, if you were interested in computers, that more or less meant you, that you had to be interested in computers in the way that people are interested in, in, in automobile engines, that you had to love the esoteric languages that computers used for their own sake, because you couldn't do very much with them. It would take hours to write a computer program that would do anything. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if, if handwriting will disappear in this way, although you know, we're still trying to decide what the best way to address a computer is. Mouses are, are perhaps 15 years old. Um, some of the newer computers that are being uh, released uh, last year and this year accept handwriting. Of course, they, oh. they turn it into print. Um, um, computers in the next few years will accept voice commands, and, and some do uh, transfer voicemail through their systems. Um, maybe we, we have handwriting and voice because it's, it's something that's so fundamental to us that the smarter computers should just learn to deal with that. But in any event, I think we'd all be very unhappy if, as computers develop, they don't make the world more transparent for us. Uh, I want, as they say in the AT&T ads, if I'm talking to someone, I want to feel that I'm really talking to them, not, not typing some anonymous letter that will get shipped <laughs> through a computer. And, uh, and that's where all that computing horsepower should go. If, if the chips can work faster, if the disks can store more information, they should be serving us. So that's, that's the hope that one has. We will see. <laughs> I would like to ask you all to, to comment perhaps on a, on a different medium of communication, and that is through the, the fine and the performing arts. What is the atmosphere, the, the, the cultural level, the culture, cultural awareness here on campus when it comes to what we, we sort of think that the fine, that's the fine arts domain there across the river? How, are, how do we compare to other institutions what is the role of the university in the community in terms of the, the, the cultural um, aspects of our society, the fine and the performing arts? And I, I, I think I will let Penelope start <laughs> with that, knowing that she has some, probably has some very strong viewpoints in that area. 
Uh, you uh, would like for me to talk about what I believe the university and community relationship is to our Fine Arts Center? Yes, and, are and that specific? And, and the role of the fine arts here on campus, both on campus and then in the greater community. It would, it would seem to me that uh, as humanity progresses, that if we're not careful, the arts will be a portion of our lives that receive less and less devotion. They unfortunately cost lots of money. We always feel like we should have more money than we do. We don't have uh, the money now to replace a concert grand that has been on our stage for 20 years. Mm. We don't have that money. And if it takes that long to get something replaced that desperately needs replacing, I think that's a very good example of what kind of trouble the arts are in. Uh, I fear a day when uh, the world no longer has com a competitive professional orchestras, hmm. when we no longer have competitive opera companies. Opera companies already are unable to travel. The Metropolitan Opera used to travel, used to come to Minneapolis, cannot afford it anymore. Uh, there are very few people who are, A, good enough, but there are very few people that the world can tolerate on a star system of being one of the world's best pianists, one of the world's best singers. When it costs $75 to go to a concert, that's more money than presently an ordinary citizen has for recreational use, mm -hmm. if you will. Those $75 are uh, put to the source of De uh, going to the dentist two times, let's say. We just simply don't feel we have the money to go and pay. So I really uh, beg, I think, the world in 50 years to, to save music or else we will be screaming in a black void. That, that scares me a great deal mm -hmm. because it's music and art, architecture, poetry that allow our souls to sing. And at this time, we have, in a way, when you consider all of the problems of the world, AIDS, the environment, economy, poverty, we need something like this to find some corner of happiness in our souls. Well spoken by a true artist. And you, you, you bring to mind that, that we are participating in a video time capsule. And this is uh, an unusual opportunity for, for the four of you now to perhaps uh, speak to the future. And you can speak your hopes or fears, expectations if you wish. Um, it's pretty much wide open. And I, I guess I will start in reverse order that we started off. And I'll, I'll let uh, Angela take the first opportunity. I guess I would express a hope that there's no longer a need for a divine design for diversity program. Mm -hmm. I would hope that everybody would accept difference as being a part of everyday life and that we wouldn't have to point out or recruit or um, have any special treatment toward anybody because everybody would just be. I'm going to just follow up if I can. Okay. I'm curious to hear your um, feelings about the role of the non-traditional student here. I don't know how many of your peers currently in the grad school or mm -hmm. through your undergraduate experience were the quote-unquote non-traditionals. Mm -hmm. uh, now, of course, the demographics in our society, we have this, this huge lump of the baby boom moving right. through. Um, will, do you think we'll see more uh, older students in the future in both the undergraduate programs here and the graduate schools? I think so, because I think that people are realizing that education should not be just from the age of 5 to 21. It's mm -hmm. something that you want to do throughout your entire life. And I think that, of course, there has been 
a large part of the population that has realized that and gone on to graduate school and to doctoral, doctoral degrees. Mm -hmm. But yet, I think that the general population is also seeing the benefit of getting education throughout their life rather than in just the small concentrated part of their life. And I think that they also realize that they might not be able to learn more at a later time period in their life, but you seem to get more out of it, maybe not factual, but in other ways if you go back to school or maybe put off getting your degree, going out and working for a while and then coming back to school. I think people are realizing that there's a lot of different ways of approaching education rather than the conventional. So I, I agree, yes, I think that there will be more non-traditional. Do you think that UW-Eau Claire has been um, more or less encouraging or nurturing of that kind of student? Um, have you, have you seen any examples of where uh, the older students are given some preferential treatment or if not treatment, at least encouragement, lots of uh, verbal positive strokes or programs that have been available for non-traditional students? Um, I think that in the classes that I've been in where there have been non-traditional students, they are encouraged by the professor and uh -huh. in fact, they usually don't need encouragement okay. because your traditional student wants to get a good grade and go out and sit in the Now, that's being pretty <laughs> stereotypical, but I mean, a lot of people do feel that way. They want to just complete a class. But somebody coming back to school realizes the importance of this unique experience. Mm. This one class, this one hour in my life is something unique, whereas the traditional student might not see it in the same light. Good, excellent comment. Thank you. Well, Paul, it's your turn. <laughs> um, actually, picking up from Angela's comment, I think one sin that is so heinous that it should be preserved uh, until the year 2050 is the uh, recent policy, policy decision that I mentioned earlier on, uh, on fees for senior auditors, uh, mm -hmm. uh, which arose from a small problem that Madison had and was passed through the system. Um, that's about the stupidest thing I've seen in my time here, actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have had several senior auditors in my class. They've just been a joy. They bring the richness that we need. Uh, I, I don't know if this decision will still be around by 2050, which should be remembered. Don't do it again. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the, the thoughts that I had, uh, um, uh, given my background, um, uh, were that there are some things that we can probably say about the year 2050 with, with more degree of surety than, than, than our societal concerns, realistic as they are. One of the things that we can say, for example, is that um, uh, that by that stage, almost certainly, the ozone over the, the northern hemisphere will have been depleted so much that an ozone hole will have opened up there, too, like the one over Antarctica. Almost happened this year, but we were saved from that by unusually high stratospheric temperatures. If we're successful in banning chlorofluorocarbons from the world, as the current treaties require by the end of the century, by the year 2050, the ozone layer may have just returned to the level that it had in 1960. So that mm. problem will be over. Hmm. Um, that will see most of us in this room out, but uh, that will be one major environmental challenge we will have responded to. However, in the meantime, we will have to live with semi-permanent um, ozone holes over both poles. we at sufficiently a high latitude here that ozone depletion should be significant here too, with unknown consequences to crops, unknown consequences to skin cancer and glaucoma and cataracts. Um, this is, just, of course, one of the many problems we're going to live with. Again, with a fair degree of surety, we can say that by the year 2050, the population of the planet will be 10 billion. That's twice its current value. Um, that may be as high as it gets, if we're lucky. But nonetheless, uh, I find it hard to imagine what a planet with twice the current population will look like. And clearly, that will have implications, even as far as Eau Claire. If global warming proceeds, as our worst um, atmospheric models indicate, we'll uh, certainly know it by then. Uh, even locally, two major implications will be that the height of the Great Lakes will increase flooding parts of northern Wisconsin. In addition, uh, many of these trees around us will be dead. Uh, current uh, biological models imply that as the temperature of the Earth increases, the prairie will expand past us northward, and many of these woods will no longer be able to survive. My great concern isn't that we'll survive this. I actually think uh, now that we will. Uh, like like uh, uh, many of the younger people here, I was born during the Cold War, and half expected us to have destroyed ourselves in the nuclear war by now. Amazingly, we didn't. Uh, we'll survive this, but the concern that I have is that um, many of the things that we treasure about the world will not survive this. Uh, 
The greatest concern that I have, and the one that I would want to instill in the students that we have here, is that it will be very easy, um, presented with multiple problems, exploding populations, wars all over the world, environmental degradation, the decreasing role of the US as a, as a leading economic power, to start operating on the principle that you do what you have to do to get by. And in a world like that, it will be very easy to dispense with art and music and a whole bunch of civil rights legislation and many of the things that we think are important in a liberal Western tradition. Uh, the greatest concern that I would have would be that, that those would just go by the board. And under those circumstances, I'm not sure I want, um, uh, I want to see what we survive into being. Um, on the other hand, I don't really fear that our students will continue to be as, uh, as uh, removed from the real world as they are. The real world is heading here. People in Eau Claire die of AIDS. People in Eau Claire are drug addicts. Global change will certainly touch Eau Claire as it touches everywhere in the world. And the tools that we have to deal with this are the awareness of that, are the increasing electronic and uh, other networking um, abilities that we will have. Um, so the outcome is unclear. Uh, I feel guardedly positive, and by the year 2050, we will certainly face most of these problems, and we will know what the outcome is. Um, but of course, dealing with problems is not the whole step. If we, if we deal with them when we lose our humanity in doing so, then we haven't. Uh, um, we, we haven't achieved very much indeed. That would be the concern I have for year 2050. Thank you. Very well spoken. I have a, a, a hope for the people in 2050 based upon what I fear in today's society. I think that I see people uh, anxious to claim a quick fix that uh, whatever, our ans what, whatever our problems are today, it seems that we must find the answer, we must find the answer quickly and move on to, to something else. And I think that I uh, send a message to everybody to remember that each person has uh, unsatisfied yearnings and needs to be able to interact well with other people. And many times we don't say to other people or we don't touch other people and say what we really feel about other people, mm -hmm. that we are uh, tight-lipped to the point of feeling that if we do say those things, others will think that we are um, too forward, if you will, and that I don't want society to lose being human. Take time. Very good. If I looked uh, at what I would like to see <clears throat> in the future, and I don't know if it's by the year 2050 or, or, uh, or, or shorter than that, I would hope shorter than that, I think we can do a better job in, in a role that, that we haven't begun to fulfill. We are a learning resource for 10,000 people. We are in an environment here of of easily 200,000, and we service 10,000. I think we can do a much better job. I think we should be a learning resource for our immediate environment. Mm -hmm. I have no problems with students traveling long distances and wanting to come here. I think that's always going to happen. But I don't think we're doing a job in our community. And part of the reason is because I don't think we're getting as much out of our resources as we have to. If I looked at myself and said, what percent are you productive? really productive, I would probably say 60 to 70 percent. I mean, I sit around and, for example, I'm, on, uh, I'm a chair of a number of committees. And it, how long does it take me to schedule a committee? Two weeks. It takes me two weeks to, I send out memos and I said check off when you can show up. And it takes me two weeks to schedule a meeting. If I looked at, at what, at my time that is productive, and I, and I would answer saying, okay, with 60 percent of my time being productive, I can probably deal with 10,000 students. As a faculty member, what do I do with the other 190,000? I mean, we are not a we're not a community learning resource. We are a resource for students that can pay to show up. It seems to me we have a bigger role, and the way to get to that bigger role is to figure out. And I'm looking at my perspective is technologically how to make people that are here much more productive. We should be able to get 150 percent of the people that we have here. And right now we're getting 60% mm. because of what the, the methods and the means that we've chosen to function. And I think we just have to do a better job. 
Oh, excellent comment. I want to give you the opportunity for anyone who has a, a last comment they'd like to make, a summary comment, observation, a question for one of the other panel members. Uh, you guys have been great. This has been a wonderful conversation. I, I've really, I've learned a lot, and it's been a, a very pleasant hour, which has uh, rapidly slipped by us. I want to say thank you to Angela Ferkus, to Paul Thomas, to Penelope Cicchini, and to Dale Johnson. Thank you so much thank you. for joining us this morning.